right. Good to have you in Sunday school this morning. First Corinthians chapter number 15. The book of First Corinthians in chapter number 15. We'll uh, continue on with our study, our verse by verse study of the book of First Corinthians. And we are rapidly closing in. I say rapidly, maybe not so rapidly, but we are closing in on the end uh, of this wonderful book of First Corinthians. We started out the first 11 verses looking at the definition of the gospel. And then from verse 12 through verse 50, Paul is dealing with the demonstration or the display of the gospel. And the demonstration and the power of the gospel is found in the resurrection. The fact that we do not serve a dead Savior, the fact that our Lord not only died and was buried, but He got up three days later. And that same resurrection power uh, that brought Jesus up from the dead will one day bring the children of God up to meet the Lord in the air as well. And then later on, maybe next week, we'll get into the deliverance of the gospel, and that is the rapture of the church. Uh, soon to be approaching. I believe, the brother, the more you watch what's going on in our days, the more Bible is being fulfilled. And I believe it could be any day now the Lord come get to church and I'd be just fine with it happening today. Nothing is precluding my heart from wanting to see my Savior split the eastern sky and get me out of this wicked world. I'm ready to go. So we'll pick back up where we left off last week. <clears throat> we'll start in verse number uh, 30. Verse number 30, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 30, Why stand we in jeopardy uh, every hour? In other words, he says, um, If there is no resurrection, then what am I putting my life on the line for? Why is my life in jeopardy? Why am I suffering all these things? But because there is a resurrection, he keeps his life in a regular uh, state of being, um, I mean, brother, persecution, distress, peril, uh, you read about those things in 2 Corinthians 11 in Paul's life. Verse 31, he said, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. And we covered that last week. That is the conundrum of the Christian life. Uh, that even though you are alive, you are to die to yourself. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so the conundrum of the Christian life is that even though we are living, we are to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive unto the Lord. Uh, my soul has been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. My soul has been cut loose with a spiritual circumcision found in Colossians chapter number 3, the operation of God without hands. God took the two-edged sword of the Word of God and cut me loose. And even though I am bound up in this jailhouse of bones, one of these days they're going to be a jailbreak. Right. Amen. And I'm getting out of here, friend. Uh, somebody likened it like this. The Christian is, the Christian is like ice cubes sitting in uh, uh, those ice containers. How many of y'all remember using them? Most people got ice makers now, but my mom and we still got some over there every once in a while when the ice maker goes on to blink. Them plastic uh, ice breakers, you fill them up with water, stick them in the freezer, and then when it gets time to use them, you twist them and crack them, and it pops the ice cubes loose. They're still in the container, but they're not of the container. They're still in the container, but they're loose from the container. And that's what the Christian life is this morning. I'm still in this body, but I'm to be loosed from the affections and the lusts of this world and this body. And I'm to put off the old man, put on the new man, Colossians 3, and live for the Lord this morning. So he said, I die daily. That's a great study for another time. All right, verse number 32. He said... If I, after the manner of me, and he's talking about all these persecutions he's suffering, his life's in jeopardy. Uh, and then in verse 32, if after the manner of me, and I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me? He said, if I'm doing all this suffering for the Lord with these people that act like brute beasts, what, what good is it if the dead rise not? If the dead don't rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Listen, y'all, if, if all life is is simply you're going to stay relatively comfortable for, you know, 70 or 80 years, and, uh, and one of these days you're going to die, and when you die, pff, it's over with, and you're meat for the worms, and you're just going back to the dirt, if that's all there is, then you're crazy for being here this morning. 
Let's just go eat, drink, live for wine, women, and song. Let's just get drunk. Let's do our own thing. Let's make a dollar or two. And let's just do whatever we want to do because it doesn't really matter in the end. <laughs> You're not going to answer to God for it. You're not going to stand before God. There is no heaven. There is no hell. There is no eternity waiting. It just, so what does it matter? Brother, what a miserable existence that would be. That's why Paul said earlier in chapter 15, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. If all you're living for is this, you got a real miserable life this morning. I'm glad I'm not living for this world. I'm living for another world this morning. But look what he said here at the beginning of verse 32. He said, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts. Um, that's a real unkind way to talk about your fellow man, isn't it? I mean, look at what Paul says about, about the people that he had to minister to and the people that he left his son after the faith, Titus, to minister to. Turn to the book of Titus and watch what he says about, about the attributes of men uh, in Titus. Titus is the book just before uh, Philemon and Hebrews there. If you find Hebrews, go back to the left, two books to Titus. And watch what he says about these... Um, there's an island out in the Mediterranean called the island of Crete. And Paul did some ministering on this island. Uh, but he ended up leaving one of his sons. Paul has three sons after the faith. Timothy is the one that's well, most well known. Uh, the other is Titus and the other one is Philemon. Or I'm sorry, Onesimus. He's mentioned in Philemon. So Onesimus, Titus, and Timothy are Paul's sons after the faith. And they're all Gentiles. That's important as well because Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. So all of his sons after the faith, the ones he led to the Lord, they're all Gentiles. But anyways, he leaves Titus in Crete. And, and watch what the Bible says about these people at Crete. Verse number, uh, we'll start in verse 9. This is what Paul is exhorting and admonishing this young preacher. He said, uh, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, talking about the Jews, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. The only reason why some people preach what they preach is just to get a buck out of people. Verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, watch what they said about the Christians, the people from Crete. The Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And Paul said this witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Boy, I, I just be honest with you, I'd love to see um, a modern megachurch pastor get up and preach about people being liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. And I mean just let the fur fly. You don't hear nothing about that, man. It's just all, let's just preach on love and peace and let's all get together and let's all cope and care and share and hold hands. How about some of that every once in a while? A good Bible, a King James Bible will mess up a lot of modern day preaching. A King James Bible will just absolutely destroy a lot of modern day preaching. Uh, and here Paul calls them beasts. Now you say, that's a, real, that's a real unkind way to talk about your fellow man. Well, you know what you find out throughout the course of your Bible? You'll find that God many times likens people to animals. And God always teaches in similitudes. He always teaches in what the Bible calls similitudes or, or types or illustrations. Everybody appreciates a good illustration. That's the way God teaches. A lot of times in the Bible you'll hear uh, the Bible said like and as. Like and as. This is like that. Or the kingdom of heaven is as this. Or the kingdom of God is like that. And what he's trying to do is he shows you something on an earthly plane that you understand. And then tells you this is what that's like. And so many times God points at an animal that people back in these days would understand. He'd say, uh, you see that animal right there? That's what mankind's like. You know about that animal? Okay, that's what people are like. Let me show them to you. Turn to the book of Job. Look at the book of Job here. We're talking about Paul said he fought with evil beasts. So just to give you some context on that, you can write these down. Look at the, if you go to Psalms and back to the left, you'll find the book of Job. And uh, Job chapter 11, watch what he says here about. I mean, this is, you know, the Bible never does build up the self-esteem of mankind. It doesn't do it. If you're looking for a self-esteem boost this morning, do yourself a favor. Don't read the Bible. Because the Bible does not build up mankind's self-esteem about himself. The Bible has nothing good to say about your rotten, wicked, sinful nature. 
The only good thing God has to say is when Jesus Christ moves in you. And that's the only good thing about me. We read here just a few weeks back in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul said, By the grace of God, I am what I am. He said, I got nothing to glory about. The only good thing about me is Jesus. But a man's old, rotten, wicked, depraved nature without Jesus, look what it's like. Job 11, verse number 12. For vain man would be wise, though man be born like. There's that like and as thing. Like a wild ass's coat. He said, you want to know what man's like? You ever seen old wild ass's coat out in the field? Can't nobody tame him. Can't nobody break him. He just running around just bucking and snorting and, rah, 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 and doing his own thing, you know, and running after the women coats and all that and trying to live his life. And just have, that, that's what man's like. That's what God looks at man like without Jesus Christ. That's what you are. You're just an old wild coat. You're just an old wild. You know the blessing about that? And I preached a message on it here a while back. The blessing about that is the Bible said when Jesus comes along, I love the hound of this, Jesus comes along and when he comes riding into town, you know what he rode? He rode upon a coat, the foal of an ass, which had never been ridden upon, the Bible said. That old wild, that old wild crazy donkey that nobody ever rode on, Jesus got on him and he just settled right on down. That's what happened to us. We're just wild, running around, bucking and screaming, doing what we want to do in this world, running hard as we could, the hell wide open, and one day Jesus got on us. <laughs> and when the Lord moved in, brother, it changed things. He ain't running around out there like a wild ass's coat no more. You want to live for God. There's a difference. And so he, he shows us that picture. Look at Jesus. Look at what Jesus said. Everybody want to talk about what Jesus said. Let's pick up what Jesus said. Look at Matthew 23. Look at what Jesus called unregenerate mankind, especially, especially religious unregenerate mankind. A man who is a religious individual, a woman who is very religious, but they're not saved. Look at what Jesus calls them. Matthew 23, verse 33. Now, my Bible doesn't have red letters in it. It's not a red letter edition. But those of you that's got it, you'll find these words are red letter. Uh, and watch what it says. Jesus says the same thing to him that John the Baptist said to him uh, early in John the Baptist's ministry. Matthew 23, verse 33. Watch what he says to him. Ye serpents, <laughs> ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? That's a, that's a good word right there, damnation. That's a word that's been pulled out of almost all of your modern day Bible versions. It's not in a new international version. It's not in an English standard version. It's not in a new living translation. Everybody understands what damnation is. Everybody out there in that lost world uses the word damn all the time. They know exactly what it means. So if we're talking about updating the book, how come they took that word out? Nothing more up to date than that word. Why take it out? Because somebody that's going to damnation would sure like to get it out of the book. I promise you that. And Jesus looks right at this crowd and he said, you are a bunch of snakes. You, know, you, you want to know what this crowd's like? You want to know what lost, unregenerate religious people are like? Watch a snake. Smooth. Slick. But then when you least expect it, pow! full of poison, full of venom. Oh, they look slick and they look good. Yeah, yeah, but they'll get you. They'll get you. Some of the meanest people on the face of the earth are religious people. I'm going to tell you this. Some of the, some of, some of the biggest uh, battles I've ever fought when I was out in public ministry or street preacher or something like that, you know who it was with? It wasn't with the drunkards or the dope heads or the prostitutes. I'm going to tell you who it was with. Most of those people be respectful, listen to what you got to say. It was people who claimed to be religious. And son, they'll flip out and go crazy. You out there preaching about Jesus and how to go to heaven, they'll come up. You ought not to judge people's religion. You ought not to. I'm not judging anything. I'm telling you what Jesus said. Tell you what the Bible said. It said serpents, generation. I'm talking about the Bible calls men beasts. Well, you write these references down. We'll not belabor this point. Luke chapter 13, verse 32. Luke 13, 32. Jesus called Herod a fox. They said, Herod is after you, trying to get you. And you, he said, you go tell that old fox 
that I'm going to work miracles today and do wonders such as that. And you read it yourself, Luke 13, 32, called Herod a fox. Um, the Bible said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 2, Paul called men dogs. He said, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Uh, Solomon called female women that don't know the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 22, he said, As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman that's without discretion. In other words, he said, what he's getting at is he's saying, if you ever saw old nasty pig walling around in the mud and eating the garbage, but somebody took a real beautiful, expensive piece of jewelry and stuck it on that swine's nose, he said, that's what a beautiful woman's like that has absolutely no discretion in her life and lives her life just for the world, the flesh, and the devil. In other words, the beauty is wasted because she don't do nothing but roll around in the mud. I'm going to give y'all a real, real self-esteem joke this morning. You ought to read over there in 2 Peter in chapter 2, verse 22. 2 Peter 2, 2, 2, 2, 22. 2 Peter 2, 22. And over there, the Bible likens, the Bible says, the dog is returned to his vomit, and the sow is returned to her wallowing in the mire. Do you realize the world has everything backwards? They do. They have everything backwards. When, they go, when, they're, when the world tries to denigrate a man, do you know what they say? They say, you're a chauvinist what? Pig. And when they try and denigrate a woman, and it's on every, every rap CD and all this and every TV show you watch, so don't act like you, know, you ain't heard it. And when they try and denigrate a woman, they call her the slang of a dog. Right? Right? Well, according to the Bible, it ain't that way. Mankind always gets it backwards. The picture of a man without Jesus Christ is an old dog. You ever watch an old dog? I love my dog. I got one over there. But at, the fact is, at the end of the day, he's still just an old nasty dog. Brother Jacob, every once in a while, I'll let that dog in the house, and when he comes in, I say, God, help. Something smells like it's dead. We'll have to go give him a bath right after we give him a bath. You know what that stupid dog will do? It don't matter how much I put money into him and how much I've fed him and how many shots I've given him. You know what? If if he finds a dead bird or a dead squirrel out there, you know what he does? He goes and rolls in it. I don't understand that. He will. He'll find it and he'll just roll all in that dead stuff. He likes that stink. It don't matter how good I make the dog look, put a nice collar on him, pet him, tell him I love him. He's an old dog. You want to know what man's like? There you go. There you go. Clean him up all you want, but without Jesus, he'll keep on rolling in the dead stuff. Yeah, you ever watch an old dog? You know, you ever watch an old dog when he gets around a female dog? You watch man? You watch men? Say, no, brother, this book's so up to date. It's, it's, it's so up to date. We don't need to be rewritten. It needs to be reread. And then you watch an old pig. You know what an old pig does? You can wash her up and clean her up and fix her up, but brother, she'll run right back to the mud and just roll in it. Digest the filth. You know what a woman is without Jesus Christ? There it is. That's a real joke to the self-esteem, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. Anyways, so he said here, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. I've been fought with the, fighting with these beasts. And as a Christian, you're going to have to fight with the beastly nature of mankind. Everybody's got a beastly nature in here. That's what that old nature is. Sister Wendy the other day put something real good on Facebook. She said she uh, was talking to a friend of hers. And the friend said, well, I've messed up and I've got issues and I've this and that. And, and I'm trying to get up and do right. I forget how it all went. And, then, and she said, I, I'll pray for you. And she said, then I walked away from the mirror. She was having a conversation with herself. You realize every child of God has those two natures? You have that old beastly nature. You have that old carnal, wicked, sensual, filthy nature that wants to roll around in the mess of this world. But if you're saved, you got another nature. And that nature wants to combat, fight against, resist against the things of this world and your old nature. Let me say this. If you don't got anything on the inside that resists that old nature that you were born with, you ain't never been saved. Because when you get saved, the Holy Ghost moves in and it resists that old man. Resists it. All right, here's a great verse. Come back to our text, 1 Corinthians 15 
Here's, here's a great verse. Every Christian in here should commit this verse to memory. This one's been in my heart for a long time. You ought to put this one in memory. This is, a fan, this is one of them great Bible verses. 1 Corinthians 15, Be not deceived. Don't be tricked about this. Don't be delusional about this. Don't think that, that you know, you're, you're going to you know, somehow be the exception to the rule. Be not deceived. Evil communications. And when he says communications, many times in the Bible, he's not dealing with just what you say. The communication as far as how you say something. He's talking about manner of life, your conduct. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Everybody in here understands that. How many times does your mom ever tell you, son, daughter, you lay down with dogs, you're going to get fleas. It is impossible for a child of God to constantly have fellowship with evil communications and it not corrupt them. And the first thing people do when you start preaching on stuff like this and you start reading 1 Corinthians about how Paul talked about separating yourself from every brother or sister that don't walk after uh, the scripture and after the ordinances that was delivered and all that, the first thing they'll say is, well, Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners. And they said Jesus ate with publicans and sinners. Yeah, he sure did. But did you notice who traveled with him and who his friends was all the time? It wasn't them. Who traveled with him? Peter, James, John, Andrew, Thaddeus, Bartholomew. He traveled with people that wanted to live for God. Yeah, he'd take a stop and go try and win somebody to himself and lead them to God. But as far as his close association, his close association was people trying to live for the Lord. And y'all, I'm not saying, you look here, take time. Take time to go out and eat with somebody and try and get them to God. Take time to try and talk to somebody and get them to Jesus and befriend somebody. Be a friend to them. Absolutely, the world needs that. But brother, at the end of the day, your deep communication, your deep friendships, it needs to be somebody that's trying to live for God like you. Because if not, I promise you, you won't pull them up, they will pull you down. Look at what your Bible said in Proverbs. Look at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 20. This is a great verse too. Proverbs 13 and 20. Talking about evil communications corrupt good manners. God trying to put something in you. You start hanging out with the wrong crowd, they'll take it out of you. They'll corrupt it. They'll mess it up. This is a great verse. Proverbs 13, 20. Proverbs 13, 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be what? It's good advice. What's the last part say? But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You want to be wise? Hang out with people that are wise. You say, what is wisdom? Well, Solomon tells us what wisdom is. Proverbs chapter 1, I believe it's verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. You want to be wise? Hang out with people that's trying to live for God, that love the book, that lift up the book, that live for Jesus. You'll be wise. But a companion of fools, they're going to get busted up every time. I love what, I love what uh, David said. David said this in Psalm 119. This, is, this has been in my heart for some time. I love this verse. Psalm 119, verse number 63. David said, Psalm 119, 63, I am a companion of of all them that fear thee, and of them that keep thy precepts. David said, my companions are those that fear the Lord and keep his precepts. Now, I have all kind of associations and people that I'm friendly with and people that I love, but mark this down. When you take survey of Cody Zorn's life, the people who are his companions... And a companion is somebody that's close to you, that walks with you on the way. A companion. You've got companionship. My companions, I promise you, they're going to be people that love the book and love the Lord. Amen. You say, wait a minute, preacher. You tell me my companions shouldn't be people that don't love the Lord and don't love the book? That's exactly what I'm telling you. It's no accident that you young people are in here this morning, that Brother John wasn't feeling well and you had to be in here. It's no accident. This verse is right down your alley, all you young people sitting here. Evil communications will corrupt your good manners. Get you some companions that love God and love the Bible and take a stand for the things of the Lord because that will help you take a stand. Uh, 
So anyways, evil communication is corrupt good manners. Matter of fact, let's look at this right here in a real practical illustration. Turn to 2 Samuel with me. 2 Samuel in chapter number 13. 2 Samuel 13. Say, what in the world are you doing up there, preacher? I'm teaching you the Bible. I'm teaching you the Bible. That's what Sunday school's about. I'll preach to you here in just a little bit, and you can get your little sermonette for a Christianette, you know, and then bounce out. But I'm teaching you the milk of the Word. 2 Samuel 13. Here's your real good illustration of evil communications, corrupt good manners. 2 Samuel 13 and verse 1. Here's something interesting for you too. Uh, after David has sinned with Bathsheba, God tells him the sword's not going to depart out of your house. Do you know the first act of recorded disobedience from one of David's child, children toward David is found in chapter 13. First recorded act of one of David's children rebelling against him is in chapter 13. Chapter 13, the number 13, is the number of rebellion in your King James Bible. Verse 1, it came to pass after this that Absalom the son of David had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon the son of David loved her. This is his half-sister. This is a warped, wicked love that he has for his half-sister. Verse 2, and Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. In other words, Amnon said, you know what, they're just, I know it's wrong. I know I shouldn't do it. I know I'll get punished for it. And he wasn't going to do a thing. It was just a thought. Look what pushed it from a thought to an action. Verse 3. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was just like the devil. Y'all remember what the first thing the Bible said about the devil in Genesis 3? The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Jonadab was a very subtle man. Come on now. Don't you let, let's 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 roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Let's roll back the curtain here for just a minute. The first cigarette you ever took a drag off of, somebody pushed you to do it, didn't they? Didn't they? Didn't they? Yeah, they did. The first liquor you ever drunk or the first beer you ever drunk, you didn't do it by yourself for the most part. Somebody was with you and said, "Try this." And it was the nastiest garbage you ever tasted in your life. I mean, brother, the first time you ever took a drag off a cancer stick and sucked down fire down your throat, you thought, this is stupid. Why do people do this? Because they got a friend. And then it becomes a habit. First time you ever took a hit off that liquor bottle, you did it and you thought, oh my gosh, how do people drink this stuff? This is rock good. Yeah, but you wanted to be accepted among what? Your friends? Yeah, that, that, that first time you took, you know, a snort off a line, took an injection that first time that you, you know, had carnal knowledge with that girl or that boy. You know what that was? It was peer pressure. What will they think about me if I don't? They'll call me a square. They'll call me a loser. Evil communication. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. I don't care if you're young or old. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You better watch out who your friends are. You better watch out who your friends are. Amnon had a friend. Mike Gray made this statement at youth camp a couple of two or three years ago. It's one of the greatest thoughts I've ever heard about friendship. And this is something that every mother and father really needs to pay attention to about this. Your children are more likely to turn out like their friends than they are like you. So you know what your job is? Control who their friends are. Don't just let them be friends with anybody. That's your job. Bless heart. I was talking with a fellow just the other day, sitting right down here at the altar in the church, talking with a fellow just the other day, um, not, on, not at church time, but a different time. He said, well, I've been missing church and I want to come to church, but a lot of times on Sunday mornings, my children just don't feel like getting up and coming to church, so I don't make them. I said, time out, bro, time out. It's not up to them. I said, do you take that same approach when it comes to school? They'll never go to school. You are the adult that God has put in their life to guide them until they finally get a moral compass of their own. Right now, they, you, you don't pull them up to the table and say, all right, y'all. You want ice cream and cotton candy and snicker bars for supper tonight? Or would you rather have meatloaf and mashed potatoes and gravy? Come on, what's a seven, eight, nine-year-old young'un going to say? Every time. 
give me ice cream and cotton candy, but you don't do it. Why? You are the authority there. You know it's not good for them. Mom and daddy, don't just let them hang out with anybody because you want them to be accepted. Vet their friends. Look at them. And if they ain't trying to back up what you're trying to live, cut it off. Mike Gray said this, your, your, your children are more likely to turn out like your fr their friends than you. And he gave Bible example for that. The Bible example is found right here. Amnon had a great daddy, David. Would everybody not agree David's a great daddy? Sweet psalmist of Israel. One of the greatest types of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Loves the Lord, loves the Bible. Amnon had a great daddy, but he had a bad friend. You know who he turned out like? His friend. Conversely, Jonathan... Saul's son had a terrible daddy. Jonathan had a father whose name was Saul who died a demon-possessed, wacko, feeling sorry for himself and consorting with women that had familiar spirits and the witch of Endor. He had a bad daddy, but he had a good friend named David. You are, your children are more likely to turn out like who you let them hang around than they are you. So make sure who they hang around are like you. Yeah, yeah. Make sure they hang around people that are trying to back up what you're doing. Well, I let them come stay at my house, though. That don't matter. If they're trying, yeah. All right, we'll move off of that right there. That's good stuff right there. That'll help you, friend. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. All right, back to our text. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Verse 34, and then he says this. Boy, what a verse this is. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness. That's good advice for every child of God in the, in the building. Awake to righteousness. Wake up. Live for the Lord. Live clean. Live a righteous life. Awake to righteousness and sin not. In this context, I'm fixing to read to you, why is the Christian supposed to live a righteous life? Why is he supposed and she supposed to stir herself every day, wake up and live a righteous life and try not to sin? I realize we do, but that don't give us an excuse to. We're supposed to issue evil and try and live for God. I fall just like you do, but that's not an excuse to do it. I am to awake to righteousness and sin not. Why? Well, one of the reasons is found here in verse 34. Look what it said. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. The cause that he is telling them to live for God is there are lost people that do not have the knowledge of God. They're not saved. They might not even believe there's a God. They're not born again. They don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ. They have not the knowledge of God, and they are watching you. You may be the only Bible that some people ever read. I wonder, I'm curious, if people scrolled through your Facebook page, could they tell that this person is a born-again child of God? They looked at your Instagram or Snapchat or Twitter. Could they tell this person a child? If they followed you around for a 24-hour period, would there be any earmarks in your life that you are trying to live a righteous life in the midst of a crooked, perverse nation? And Paul says it like this at the end. He said, I speak this to your shame. In other words, the shame is... The shame is that there were lost people in this community. And we looked at this way back when we started. Y'all remember way back when we started, Paul said this. Paul said, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication is not as named among the Gentiles. He said, there's all kind of junk going on in the church that the world is pointing at you. And that's why they're not getting right with God because you're living a wicked testimony. Now, I'm going to tell you, there ain't nothing worse. And I, I, I have seen this happen. Not only since I've been here, but in my Christian life. There have been times where I have personally talked with people and they'd say, well, I'd come to your church, but so-and-so goes there and I know they drink. And so-and-so goes there and they got a filthy mouth. And so-and-so goes there and they're not living. And brother, that's, a, that's to your shame. That's a shame that somebody may not get right with God because my testimony or your testimony is such that when a lost man looks at it, they say, I want to undo what y'all got. Isn't that bad? 
He said, I speak it to your shame. I'll never forget, long as I live, the church that I come out of, the church that I um, uh, saved and called to preach basically at, um, when my uncle first took that church, when my uncle first took that church, uh, you know, Lord, 20 years ago now, I guess, when he first took that church, though, there was some really messed up stuff happening behind the scenes that, that he had no idea about when he took the church. About a year later, it came out and things had to be dealt with. And well, The way it came out was this. He was out knocking doors one day, Brother John, and he knocked on a particular door in a little community right down the street from the church. And when they come to the door, they started talking with the preacher, and he started talking with them and telling them, uh, you know, inviting them to church. And they said, well, where do you go to church at? Where do you pastor at? He said, well, I pastor the Emmanuel Baptist Church right down the street here. And they literally busted out laughing in his face. And he said, well, why, why are you laughing? And they said, and I'll not call the name. I could, they, you would know him anyways. The fellow's dead now. They said, doesn't know so-and-so go to church down there and his son and daughter-in-law and all that? Preacher said, yeah, they sing in the choir, they, yeah. They got to laughing, they said, everybody in this community knows that that daddy-in-law is having sex with that daughter-in-law. Everybody knows. Said, they're not even sure if that last baby that she had is even the boys, it might be daddy's. And come to find out, it was the truth. Come to find out, it, was, it wasn't an accusation, it wasn't just some hearsay. Come to find out, it was true. It was true. That's a shame that somebody walk that somebody would show up at church, you know, claim to love God and have open, I mean like open apparent sin in their life. I'm not talking about you messed up and you got right. I'm talking about you're living daily in that sin and the world knows it. That's a shame. And so he said, awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So he give us some, some real practical stuff there for a minute and now he's jumping back to our original thought which is the resurrection let's get back on the resurrection here verse number 35 now that's been some real practical stuff for you to grab a hold of there in verse 32 33 34 but now we're back on task here for the next six or seven minutes verse 34 or uh, 35 excuse me he said but some man will say how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come in other words, he's saying here, Paul is taking and playing the role of an unbeliever who doesn't believe and he doesn't receive and he doesn't understand the resurrection. He's only mocking it. Somebody's just mocking it and saying, well, when a man dies, what's he come up like? I mean, does he come up all messed up and tattered and mal, you know, uh, worm-eaten? I mean, what's he come up like? You know, it's just a fellow making fun of the resurrection. And watch how Paul deals with a scoffer. Um, I... I I have all the patience in the world for an individual that sincerely asks questions and is looking for the truth. I got, I got as much patience as anybody. I'll take all day long, all night, all week. I'll, I'll hang with you right on if you're sincere. But a person who is just simply a scoffer or a railer, and they are not doing, they're not asking questions for truth. They're asking questions just because they want to be, you know, um, uh, a religious stumbling block for somebody. I take the same position that Elijah, Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, and the Apostle Paul took. You say, what's that? A real sharp answer. That to this modern religious world looks really, you know, well, that's unkind, that's uncaring. Look what Paul says if he's dealing with somebody that's just a scoffer. Verse 36, thou fool. Well, you're so, you're, you're not a... You're not exhibiting the love of Christ. You, you, sir, you do, not, you do not exhibit the fruits of the Spirit in your life. You know what really blows my mind, blows my mind? Um, I, 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 try, I try and be a good boy and stay off of, you know, uh, arguments with people and things like that, especially on social media because it's pointless and it doesn't do any good. Every once in a while, I'll just make a little interjection. But here for the last several months on my personal Twitter account, I'll just throw out King James Bible stuff. Why we believe the King James Bible? Why the mother virgins are messed up and all that kind of stuff. And son, you don't talk about idiots coming out of the woodwork and they're not looking for truth. They're just looking to scoff. And I answer them accordingly. Accordingly, with a sharp answer. And you know some of the first things people will come back... I've watched your tweets, and you do not exhibit the love of Christ, and you do not exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. How about try that one on for size? Paul said, you're a fool. 
I don't have any patience for somebody that they're not looking for truth. They're just looking to be a stumbling block in the way of truth. Have no patience for them. Neither did Jesus. You say, how do you know Jesus didn't? Did you read Matthew 23 where we quoted from earlier? (laughs) Jesus looks at that crowd who were religious scoffers and over and over he said, serpents, vipers, damnation of hell, twofold more the children of hell than yourselves, whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. You can pass sea and land to make one proselyte when you made him, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. And here's what bothers me about people. They'll get on me because, like they said about Paul, his speech is rude and contemptible. But they have no problem whatsoever with somebody tearing down the Word of God and somebody's faith in the Word of God. You double-barreled, egg-sucking hypocrite. You have no problem with somebody saying, well, the King James Bible has a mistranslation here and it's wrong there and that word should be taken. You have no problem with somebody literally stealing the words of God from this generation so that they think they're their own authority and God has no final authority. But yet when I rebuke somebody sharply for it, oh, you're so uncaring. Get out of here with that stuff, man. I have no patience for that. Somebody who will criticize my book and try and downplay the word of God which is exalted above his name. Brother, look here. There ain't enough adjectives to describe somebody as sorry as that. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. You say, I don't feel that way. That's because you don't like the book enough. That book's the most important thing on the face of the planet. The words of God. Thou hast exalted thy word above thy name. The most important thing in your house is not your gun, is not your safe, is not your car, your cash, your clothes. The most important thing in your house should be the words of the living God. He says here, thou fool. Uh, and, then he's, and then he answers, he said, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, quickened, made alive. It's not quickened except it die. Isn't it funny? Isn't it, isn't it hilarious talking about people that want to change your Bible? They, they always say this. They always say, Brother Keith, they say, well, we can't understand the King James Bible. We can't understand the King James Bible. We need to update the King James Bible. So when they come to words like over there in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick, or here where it says quickened, they update that, and they change it to alive. But yet, yet then they'll make movies like they made with Sam Elliott, and then they made a remake with Gene Hackman and Sharon Stone and all them, and they'll make movies, and they'll call it the quick and the dead. Well, now we can't understand that Hollywood. We don't know what you're talking about. Millions of people went to see it and didn't even know what they were seeing because they couldn't understand what the word quick meant. Everybody knows it means alive. The living and the dead. The quick and the dead. And here the Bible, they just take it from a King James Bible. They just get right out of a King James Bible. He said, thou fool, that which thou sowest, talking about the resurrection body, is not quickened. It's not made alive except it die. This old body's going to die one day. But God's going to bring it back up. It's going to be made alive. He uses that, remember I told you several weeks ago, it's that harvest illustration. It's that sowing and reaping illustration that he uses. Look at verse 37 and we'll close on this verse right here. He said, that which thou sowest, he's making a corollary between sowing and reaping in a field and your mortal body that gets put in the dirt at death and comes back up at the resurrection. That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. In other words, he says, what you put in the dirt, that ain't what comes up. I'm, I'm no gardener, but I know this much. When you plant corn, you know what you do? You don't plant a whole stalk of corn. You know how you plant corn? One kernel. Throw it in the ground. You know what it does? It dies, germinates, and you know what happens when it comes up? It don't come up a kernel. It comes up a... Is that, is that, is that, that is amazing to me. God is amazing in what he does in creation. That you put down a little kernel in the ground and water it and give it some sunshine and up pops an entire stalk with ears everywhere that's got hundreds of kernels on each ear. You put one kernel in the ground and thousands of kernels come back up. You put one apple seed in the ground and a whole tree comes up at that one seed and then a bunch of apples with a bunch of seeds inside of it. So he's making a comparison. One of these days, this old dying, decaying, hair receding, (laughs) pot belly poking out, amen, aching body that I've got, if Jesus don't come back, y'all going to plant me in the dirt. 
I'm going to get planted. But y'all, this ain't what I'm coming up like. <laughs> Sown in weakness, raised in power, ready to live in paradise. I'll have a new body, praise the Lord. I'll have a new life. Yeah, I'm going down one way, I'm coming up another. And next week, we'll find out how we're coming up. Next week, we're going to tell you about the body that we're going to come up as. The Bible says that we're going to have a body fashioned like unto His glorious body. You want to know what your body is going to be like at the resurrection, at the rapture of the church? Go read about when Jesus resurrected and He appeared to them disciples in them upper rooms. Boy, that'll give you an insight into what your body's going to be like at the resurrection. I mean a body that can appear and disappear, just like that. Walk through walls. I mean, make it to the third heaven, which is way out there past the farthest star that the Hubble telescope's ever seen, and make it back in the matter of moments. I mean, moving faster than the speed of light. And on top of all of that, every Baptist ought to shout right here, that body can eat just to eat. You say, where do you get that from? Read Luke 24. Jesus shows up and says, a spirit don't got flesh and bones as you see me have. Matter of fact, he said, I'll show you that I'm really alive. And they gave him some fish and a honeycomb, and he sat there and ate it right in front of them. Glory. Yeah, there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb, friend. The Bible says so. So, uh, all right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Help us to take the warnings from the word this morning. God, there were several warnings uh, that were given to us throughout these verses. Uh, God, Paul gives us this great warning about... Uh, fighting this old beastly nature that's in us. Paul gives us this great warning about watching our companions and who it is that we associate with because they can corrupt our good manners in Christ. Paul gives us this great warning about uh, living a righteous life because lost people are watching us. God, I pray this morning that you would help us to take these things to heart, put them into practical use in shoe leather, and use them for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you. You're dismissed.